Over the past 20 years, I've spoken many times about the toll inflicted on innocent civilians and, and U.S. soldiers from anti-personnel landmines. I've talked about it here, uh, in Ottawa, actually in most parts of the, of the world. The reason I've talked so much about landmines is that like booby traps, they're inherently indiscriminate. They're triggered by whoever comes in contact with them. 161 nations, including most of our allies and friends, certainly those in NATO, have signed a treaty banning them. 161 nations have had the courage to sign a treaty banning use of landmines. Unfortunately, the United States is conspicuously not, not among the countries that have had the courage to do that. In 1994, 20 years ago, in a speech to the UN General Assembly, President Bill Clinton called for the elimination of anti-personnel landmines. And two years later, in 1996, President Clinton said this, today I'm launching an international effort to ban anti-personnel landmines. And he went on, President Clinton did, to announce a U.S. plan to develop alternatives to landmines with the goal that the U.S. would end its use of anti-personnel landmines by 2006. We had a meeting in Ottawa where nations came together and said, let's have, let's have an anti-personnel landmine treaty. And nations came together. But in 1997, the United States missed an opportunity to be a leader in the international effort to ban anti-personnel mines. They didn't even become a member. They did not sign the mine, uh, the mine ban treaty. Gave up not only their leadership role, some would say gave up a follower, followership role. So 2006 came and went. President Clinton's administration ended. President George W. Bush served for eight years. President Obama was then elected and then reelected. In the meantime, U.S. troops fought two long ground wars. And incidentally, Madam President, they fought those ground wars without using anti-personnel landmines. But in 2010, along with 67 other United States senators, Democrats and Republicans, I sent a letter to President Obama. We commended him, we both Republicans and Democrats, for agreeing to review the U.S. government's policy on anti-personnel mines. We urged him to conform U.S. policy to the Mine Ban Treaty. That could be a first step. That was five years ago. Five years since the start of that review, and we're still waiting for the results. So after 20 years, three United States presidents, there's no evidence the United States is any closer to joining the treaty than when President Clinton made that speech. I find it disheartening as an American to think that my country is unwilling to stand with these 160 other countries, many of whom face really great threats, we won't join them. Now, the Pentagon has long argued, argued that it needs landmines to defend South Korea. When 1996, the then Secretary of Defense, William Perry, said the Pentagon would, quote, move vigorously to achieve alternative ways to prevent a North Korean attack so they no longer need landmines. So back in the last century, in 1996, it was announced we'd move vigorously. Well, I don't know what their definition of, of vigorous is, but after 20 years, there's no evidence they've done anything to revise their career war plans without anti-personnel mines 
or that any of the three presidents have told them to do that. Now, one could ask what difference it'd make if the U.S. joins the mine ban treaty. As I said, we have not used uh, anti-personnel mines for 23 years. The United States does more to support humanitarian demining than any other country in the world. We have not exported anti-personnel mines since the Leahy Law was passed in 1992. And we spent many tens of millions of dollars through the Leahy War Victims Fund to aid those injured by mine. So if we're not causing the problems, why even bother? Well, anti-personnel landmines continue to kill and cripple innocent people. Because indiscriminate victim-activated weapons have no place in the arsenal of a civilized country. This is like going back to the days of poison gas, and apparently there's only one uncivilized leader that uses poison gas today. And then look at this treaty, banning these weapons. When you go with countries as diverse as Afghanistan to Great Britain, they've signed it. And here's the United States, unwilling to join. And of course, the United States has by far the most powerful military in the world. And this treaty needs the strong leadership of the United States. As President Obama said in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize, I'm convinced that adhering to standards, international standards, strengthens those who do and isolates and weakens those who don't. Well, 20 years after President Clinton's UN speech, President Obama can give real meaning to those words by putting the United States on a path to join the treaty. That means destroying what remains of our stockpile of mines. We're never going to use them, get rid of them. And it means revising our Korea war plans to get rid of anti-personnel mines. President Obama is the only one who can make that happen. Time is running out. Madam President, let me tell you a story. During the ill-fated Contra War, back at the time of the Reagan administration, I was visiting one of the Contra camps along the Nicaragua border. Um, the the uh, Nicaragua and Honduras border. And as I left in a helicopter, we saw a clearing inside Nicaragua where there is a field hospital. So we decided to land. There's a rude hel heliport there we could land. And I talked to the doctors who were treating victims, but this little boy about 10 or 12 years old came out, he had a makeshift crutch. He had one leg. And we talked with him and came from a family that earned their uh, ability to live from what they could hunt and gather in the, in the jungles along the border. And as we talked to him, it turned out he lost a leg by stepping on an anti-personnel mine. Mines that weren't going to stop any army. They were just there to terrorize and injure civilians. You know, I think of these victims. This is not the, the person, but this is an example of what we see. And I asked him, which side put this mine there? Well, he had only a vague knowledge of what the two countries were and that there's a border there. All he knew is that his life was changed forever. He would not be able to earn the living like his parents and grandparents and others had. He had a place to stay only because the doctors 
put a pile of rags and sheets in the corner of the floor, of the dirt floor, in the place where people recovering would stay and he could sleep there at night. Nice boy, tragic case. I then became more and more interested in the case when I look at people like this young girl, legs gone, hands gone. I think of those in conflicts who, children who have seen what they thought was a pretty and shiny toy on the side of the road and touched it only to have their limbs blown off or their eyesight lost. I think of the girl I met, teenage girl, in an area where there was a conflict, I met her in the hospital. And her story was this. She was getting artificial legs through the Leahy War Victims Fund, but her parents are in the conflict that sent her away where she could be safe. Conflict was over. She's coming down the road. She sees her parents. She calls out to them and runs toward them in a flash. Steps on a landmine, loses both legs. Now, after World War I, countries came together to say we should ban poison gas. And we had meetings at international meetings to do that. The reaction of our Pentagon was to our negotiator, yeah, don't be too quick. We may need them sometime, even though we'd never use them. I still get the same reaction. Well, you're banning them. We may need them. This is one of the places, the Leahy War Victims Fund. We make artificial legs out of indigenous material. If any one of the senators here in this body were to lose a leg, our insurance would buy us a high-tech leg to replace it. And we might be told, but you could have an even more high-tech one if there'd be another $500,000 beyond what the insurance is going to pay. We'd all take out our checkbook and we'd pay it. We're talking about countries that have a per capita income of three or $400 a year. Now, Signing the landmine treaty is not going to, by itself, stop everything. There are millions of these buried throughout the world. And the United States, as I said earlier, but to its credit, spends and has spent hundreds of millions of dollars to clear them and to help people. But, but, why shouldn't the United States of America a country that should be the moral leader on this. Why shouldn't we step and sign the treaty? How do we lecture countries that are going to use these? And they say, yeah, but you never even signed the treaty. You've reserved your own right to use them. Why shouldn't we? You're the most powerful nation on earth. We're not. Why shouldn't we? Now, I am proud of the Leahy War Victims Fund, but Madam President, I would give anything to think there is no need for it, to think there is no need for it. Maybe that day would come. Tell President Obama, time is running out. You know what you should do. You know what you should do. I think if you talk to President Clinton, he'd find President Clinton wish he had signed it. We'll sign it now. Do that. That could be part of his legacy.